Hi, this is Raymond Better Tattooing, and today we're going to be talking about capillary cartridges while my phone goes crazy because I got 110 emails in five minutes. All right. <laughs> Now that that's over with, yes, my phone is going crazy. <laughs> so if we hear a bunch of bings and dings in the background, I got this watch thingy on to make sure that I don't just like die. Or if I do fall down and die, it lets my wife know so she can come and get me. Uh, so I apologize in advance. It'd be funny to look at this video down the road and be like, oh, back when I was popular. Well, it was popular, it was so fun. No, that wasn't. Uh, anyways, <clears throat> capillary cartridges. You've probably seen these all over the place along with a bunch of other you know, needle combinations and tubes that are just unique and it's like people are trying to reinvent the wheel. And I, I say this because there seems to be a break in the history of tattooing and there may or may not have been some lost knowledge to think that this is new and it hasn't been done by someone before when it has. These type of tubes were used long ago by people in tattooing because, well, they were made out of steel, not plastic, of course. But to ream the, the ends of these things, they would have to use various tools that would create boring and, and uh, you know, drill marks inside of them. Uh, and so, <laughs> this is like the, the beginning of like Western tattooing, right? What, what would happen is inside of the tube, if you blow it up, you know, and you'd see these like rifling marks basically inside of them, right? And what it would happen is without it being polished, these ridges inside of the ends of the tube would restrict pigment flow by creating small eddies or spaces inside of it. Like if you think about uh, <clears throat> having a surface, if we just lay it out horizontally here, where we're trying to have something pass this way, what these ridges do is they create an impedance, right? Something that's gonna slow things down. Because as fluid's moving over them, some stuff is gonna be pushing back against it as it naturally rolls up against these lines. And what that does is it causes small breaks where this pigment will be moving forward and then it'll be slowed down, sometimes even reversed. So it creates inconsistencies depending on how these are placed. And we start getting into like really small scale, them being not extremely precise next to each other can create these, these weird eddies where we have a bunch of gunk basically getting stuck into them. Now, with, with old tattoo technology, like the early 1900s in the West, this was just a byproduct of, of the technology that was available at the time, right? We couldn't have these, you know, ultra precise diamond cut, blah, 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 cast whatever things that were going on. I mean, there would be pitting and there would be rifling and there would be different marks throughout it, right? Because there's impurities. Now, I'm not saying that it isn't there nowadays, of course, right? But the, we're getting into smaller and smaller scale where the smaller that it gets and the more precise that these pieces are when they're made, we're not gonna have as much of an impedance. It's going to happen regardless. So what, what they used to do is they would polish the tubes, right? So when you have this versus uh, a smooth outcome, the idea was is that pigment flow wouldn't be inhibited, right? What we're gonna be using when we're, when we're doing a tattoo to control the pigment is gonna be that back pressure of the needle against the end of the tube. That's where band tension came in, right? If you've ever used a coil machine and you haven't had any bands on it, you know that, that needle just bounces around like crazy. But if it is actually set in the tube correctly and there's enough band pressure against the back, what you're doing is creating a, sp a space inside of the end of the tube where the needle is coming through. We're gonna have a small bit of pigment on the inside against that back acting as a lubricant moving around it, which is also going to change the volume in which that pigment is allowed to roll around the outsides and the top. And this is part of a complex system where we're thinking about pigment dynamics in and of itself, like its viscosity, its flow rate, things like this which is really, really heavy technical stuff. But realistically, these types of smooth things when operated correctly would dispense pigment perfectly. When you would have these minor occlusions, what you'd have is sputtering, where you would have pigment come out and you know, different sizes and amounts as you were doing the tattoo, which would make it wholly inconsistent. So history aside, now we're getting into these, these capillary cartridges that people have decided are a necessity. And 
So why are they required right now? More often than not, it's because people are running their machines incorrectly. So what causes a pigment dump? We'll do pigment dump, right? Uh, pigment dump. What causes it? The, the first thing is, is that you're running your machine wrong. We'll make this. Oh, sorry, guys. Um, if you're running it wrong, that means you're not using the tube in its intended state, right? If you're pulling against the back of it, allowing, and this is with bands or bladders, right? It doesn't matter. If you have your needle tip coming out and your needle coming out of that tube tip and you're interacting with the skin, the force of that being held against the back is going to control the pigment coming out of it, right? Like that's, that's the one-on-one -on -one aspect of this. When you start moving it, and if we like think about this blown up, right? If we have our tube here and our needle against the back, we have a small gap of that stuff, our pigment is only gonna be flowing out of a few spaces, right? Because it's being held against the back. It has to roll around, over, through, etc. So that's why these, these spaces around the needles are gonna be so specific and why we need, like we can't just use one tube tip. Like we can't use this giant 15 round for a three needle or something, right? Or single needle, because it's gonna to have too much flow rate. So when you're, when you're using it, you're pushing that needle against the back of this, moving in a direction so that vent is always like moving into your, your line or your shade or your color or your pack, then the pigment is gonna be coming out in a very consistent manner. Right? You're not going to have a whole bunch of extra stuff clumping up underneath the bottom, moving the needle off of the tube tip because that back pressure is going to be constantly scrubbing and cleaning it. Simple stuff. You start getting caking around the ed outside edges of your tube tip the longer that you run it, uh, which is why we try to clean it constantly, you know? Um, <clears throat> and uh, why you do all those weird hand motions when you're cleaning it too, to knock that needle against the side. Uh, anyways, <laughs> so that back pressure is really, really important. Most people nowadays are actually moving their needle against its natural state of operation, right? So they, they end up pulling the needle and it ends up skipping away from the back. When this happens, it, it ends up creating a larger gap where more pigment can come through. So if you compare two side by side and we're thinking about the space that's available, because the pigment's gonna come out about midline on this stuff, right? There's just more room for it to come out, which is why there's a dumping effect. And initially, it's usually just because you've, you've started and it's gone plop. I mean, the other thing is that you've overfilled the cartridge quite a bit. Where these, that's where these things actually can help, but uh, we'll get to that in a second. Anyways, um, you'll see when you, when you go to dip your machine, a lot of people will just be running it and they just dip and they bring it in. And if you look at the bottom of the reservoir where the tube tip is, you know, it comes out like that and has that little dip, they'll have a ton of extra pigment here. And what happens is when they tip it down, this stuff sloshes forward and any of the excess ends up coming up through those extra spaces up in the top. So that's why normally like some people I'll see they'll dip and they'll flick, get out any of the excess. So there's just enough in there to run what they need to. Or you turn off your machine, dip, wipe any of the excess off, turn it back on again, and it'll only pull up what it needs. So that's, that's, that's usually what's happening, right? This is why those pigment dumps happen. I mean, for mechanical operation, it's one of the easiest ways to fix it is just like one, start running your machine correctly and dip a little bit more conservatively. Then you're not wasting you know, a bunch of ink. Uh, another reason why is just like in pigment chemistry, we'll do this one, it's like bad operation. Another one is pigment viscosity. And a lot of people will probably argue about this one, but like pigment viscosity is gonna be like how thick or thin it is, right? And some people be like, I hate thin ink because when I do it, it gets all over the place. Well, it's probably because you're just not using your machine correctly. And I'm not saying like, I know there's like world famous people who'll be like, my tattoos are better than yours and it happens to me. I, okay, I, that doesn't mean that you don't know what you're doing. Uh, but it may mean that you don't know how to operate a fucking tattoo machine. <laughs> it's fine. It's like building a house. Like I could see somebody who builds a house and they're the best builder on the planet. And then they go up against an engineer who knows some of these aspects, you know, in, in an academic sense. And they're saying this type of concrete is necessary for the structure. And the person who builds it goes, I don't give a shit. Look at my house. Anyways, 
Uh, picking viscosity can cause this to happen as well. If you're using your machining correctly uh, and you have a pigment dump, it's going to happen more often with things that are thick than thin. That's why there's so many performance enhancers in modern tattoo pigment, right? They'll put resins and, and glycerins and thickening agents and weird chemicals to make things change how that fluid interacts, when, especially when it's under motion. So a lot of the science has gone into like pigment viscosity as of recently is just to accommodate these artists in operating the way that they do. Um, and it's kind of weird because I'll see people who are running like black and they say it dumps all the time, but it doesn't happen when I use yellow, red, or green. And it's like, <laughs> okay, so thick versus thin, maybe that's why it is. Maybe it is the pigment viscosity, but it probably also is just like, bad operation. But this can happen sometimes. If you have a pigment that is far too thin and you're using a setup that isn't totally tailored for it correctly, like if you're using a split 3.5 tube and you have a one in it just because you're on the road, or if you have you know, a, a nine mag in a 13 tube, pigment viscosity can actually change how that operation works. And yes, you can run a nine and a 15. Uh, I've done it. It's very careful. Uh, <laughs> but you will have more pad, like dump when that happens, unless you're using a really thick pigment. So the pigment viscosity allows tolerances to be a little bit looser in the operation of any of these these products when they're actually you know uh, being used in 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 real world. So that's 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 the the background stuff. So now capillary cartridges. I think I might be. Make, make things blink and I think about to run out of time. So I'm going to reset here and then we'll talk about that. Remember to like, subscribe, and if you want to show support for the show, check out the video description for a link to our Buy Me a Coffee website thing. We appreciate any and all support that you've given us so far and hopefully we'll continue to in the future. Okay, capillary cartridges. So, how do these work? We already talked about how that impedance is going to occur when we have a whole bunch of occlusions in the natural flow state of where that, that pigment is coming. Now, the interesting thing to note about most of these when they're being made is that it doesn't create an even bevel coming down. If we look inside of these, that's off-centered. What we see from the outside is these lines coming around, right? They can either be a spiral that's going down or just ridges that are running along it. And so, let's do this again. Just another illustration, whoop. Um, what happens is if we look at it from the outside, we're seeing pigment collect inside of these spaces in between those ridges, rifling lines, spirals, screw threads, anyways. Um, <clears throat> and it makes us see when we're running something that there is just a lot that's stuck up in there. It's cool, right? Um, but when you think about this and you flip it and you look on the inside, what you actually notice is that the space that's going through the actual like tube tip has just been extended, right? If you look down the center of it, you take, take the tube off, take the back off, and look down the center, what you're going to see is a straight tube tip and it, it's just been extended up to that point of wherever it matches the usually the end bevel on the tube tip by where the vent is right and it has compacted that space so we're, we're not even seeing the ridges and lines that are in here what we're going to see on the outside is just wherever that taper is moving down so if we think about <clears throat> what we're seeing on the outside where we see that, that bevel that's happening on the inside it literally is this and we're seeing these little divots and stuff coming out at different lengths, but they are all leading to the exact same center diameter, which is really, really weird to me. If you're going to do this, at least have them cut back so that it's it's only causing a mild bit of, of, of breakdown on this, right? They're, they're thinking about, you ever seen pilot pens? We used to have them back in the day. It was great. You could sit there and flick them against your hand. They'd spray ink everywhere in the classroom. And they had these type of delivery systems. When given enough force, they would shoot a ton of stuff out. And what was funny is if you did it once, those pens were toast. They would constantly leak after that because they have the same spiral you know, set up and things would just drip out slowly. <clears throat> that's without you know, a whole bunch of extra force behind them. If you have something that's pushing and pulling at the same time, you're going to get hang inside of it. And why? Because there really is no actual space for that needle to go through without interacting with one of these occlusions right? that are, that are stopping the flow of pigment. We may get pigment that's pulled up into these spaces, but when it's filled with pigment past that, how does it start to come out? 
as it goes, we have to get rid of each layer independently as it's going down. So you're going to have pigment starting at the top. This is going to be the first to go. As it starts to empty and move down from here, additional force is going to be required to have that second pull come out. And third, fourth, fifth, etc., etc., moving down, right? Until you get to a point where <clears throat> it's usually about halfway through, the force of the machine moving up and down doesn't have enough power to actually continually pull any of this out because there's not the extra weight on that fluid forcing it using gravity and including that mechanical force to pull it out of the tube tip so you end up getting hang and when you get hang with tattoo equipment what happens is especially if you're tattooing a larger scale product or project is it ends up getting really dirty it's very difficult to clean out. You're gonna get gunk inside there. Dead skin cells, exudate, things like that that'll dry. Especially if it ever runs down to that point. These spots up here are gonna start filling up really, really quickly. And what happens when that does is then you end up just with basically a shank that is just this long, narrow tube that all of the pigment has to flow through from the backside of where that reservoir is, and it's going to take longer, it's going to be more inconsistent, and you're going to be left with more sputtering. So, for most standard operations where you're wanting a steady pigment flow, this is not going to be a long-term solution. If you're doing something that's going to take five or ten minutes and you have like a single dip into an ink cap, you're doing something fine, like fine. Like I don't see any issue with it. But if you're rocking like a you know eight-hour session with tons of different things, there's more efficient ways to get it done. Using these will increase the time in the skin. That's my hypothesis on this. I think if you use these, you are going to make more money because you're going to take longer to do that. And if that's your goal, you're in this to make money and da da da, that's fine. I don't care. <clears throat> Go with these. The downfall is, is if you aren't very skilled in what you're doing, especially visually in identifying the things that are going on with the tattoo, there is a greater chance that you're going to increase trauma with these, right? Because the decreased pigment flow is going to like make it so you have to go over things slower or you're going to have to go over them more. And when that happens, we start getting those, those, especially with lining, you get those raised lines, right? These type of rays, like the, the, the skin that's being glossy, it's lifted over when you, it feels like braille when you hand, run your hand across a tattoo. That's bad. That's, that's scarring. That means that you have damaged that skin to a point the body has gone, oh shit, I can't heal this normally. Let's fix it like this. It's like totaling a car and fixing it with Bondo. It's, it's not gonna make it back to, you know, near perfect restoration. <laughs> so, I don't know, like a car analogy was kind of, I got like halfway through and I was like, oh, that sucks. Anyways, it'll stand. Um, this, this, this can be a useful tool, but only in, in small, doses, right? I don't know if they have these out for flats yet. And if they do, if the tip is going to be completely like, like straight and they're trying to pull these, these screw marks into, so I'm just working through something, into like a flat, I, I honestly, one, don't see how it would work, right? Because we're, we're trying to think about that, that drain-like effect. We're trying to create a, like a Venturi effect, pulling that, that, that fluid out of it at a specific, you know, speed. But it, it's, it doesn't matter. Like everything with these is just, it works backwards. It's counterintuitive. And the reason why is because if we constantly have a stream running out of it, this is beautiful. They'll have continuous flow coming out of it. But our, our needles move up and down. So it's like kinking a hose all the time, right? And then having one of these screw ins on it. It's gonna end up just kind of going all friggin' nuts. If you have something that's pulling against it and pushing, it's just gonna cause the stuff to get locked in there. I haven't thought this thing, uh, I've been thinking about it for like a few months, right? And, and I've, I've, I bought some, I took them apart, and I looked at them and I was, I was honestly kind of amazed that, that this has become something because it seems not, not necessary especially when you have to pay the prices that you have to for this stuff. It's just jeezy, crazy. Well, that's my opinion. I know some people be like, they're the best thing and you're full of shit. I don't give a fuck. Like, I mean, bite me. This is just the science stuff behind this, right? Like, if you want to, I can put out the models and stuff. And I, I put them up on some CAD program, and I ran them. And the, the interesting thing is when you blew up some of the fluid stuff that was moving through these ridges, I mean, it literally was just a hang. You can, they have color coded or temperature map showing how things flow. And as it's coming through the center, they have an increased velocity of a, a smaller volume of pigment, but it's so focused around where the needle should be. 
when you put a needle in it, and I haven't done that one yet where we're seeing it reciprocate, I can just see it impeding it, right? Because those needles are gonna be sitting so close to where those ridges are in some cases, the, the pigment is gonna to have to find another way. And when we look at like how our needles normally go through, right? If they're sitting in the bottom, it has to come around the sides and the top with only a small amount, you know, creating lubrication on the back. If we're impeding that, right? And creating a smaller space, it's just gonna slow the pigment down, which is, I guess, what they're advertising. But how slow, like, this, I just, I don't know. It's flabbergast, I'm, I'm just blown away. I don't understand. But that's what we do. Anyway, so that's capillary cartridges, a little bit of the history on that stuff, and why I think it's not a good idea. Um, I would prefer to see people operate their machines in a way that, that is not taught by the TV shows, you know, and I know that apprenticeships nowadays, just like the education systems in the United States, are fundamentally broken, and that's because the vast majority of tattooers out there haven't had a real apprenticeship. They may have had an apprenticeship where they had to suffer and self-teach themselves through whatever they're doing, but that aspect of, of, of passing on education and like being able to avoid mistakes that we've made in the past has, has kind of evaporated in most cases where people are still making the same mistakes that they've been making for 50, 60, 70 years because no one is talking to each other and no one really wants to think about the bigger picture here that maybe this has already been done. Anyways, that's the video for today. If you like this, subscribe, buy a shirt, I don't know. And uh, that's it. Let me know what you think in the comments. This is good, yay, a little bit more of a deeper dive. Uh, if not, it's really long. Let me know if you want a shorter format. I could do this in four minutes. Maybe. Anyways, it's Ryan from Better Tattooing. Sign along.